Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Corcoran. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the conservation program manager for the Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club. I am also the uh, coordinator for Save Pennsylvania's Forest Coalition, which is the coalition that is putting on this series that you will be watching today. This is the fourth of our Get to Know Your Forest webinars that we have put on so far. Um, I will share links out to the recording for the presentation at the Tyadotten State Forest, Delaware State Forest, and Michaud State Forest after the fact for anyone who would like to watch the recordings of any of the other presentations that we have done so far. Um, I am very pleased to uh, introduce three foresters today from Forbes State Forest, Celine, Rachel, and Brandon. And they will be uh, discussing uh, the ins and outs of Forbes State Forest. So I'm really excited that you're joining us today and that we'll all be able to learn a little bit more about some of the public lands that are here in Pennsylvania. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to the foresters. And um, like I said uh, previously, any questions that you have, please put them in the chat and I will read them off at the end of the presentation. So um, take it away. Thanks for coming and joining us and learning about the Forbes today. If you're familiar with the Forbes, I invite you to share your favorite spot in the chat. Um, it'll be helpful for people that maybe aren't so familiar with the Forbes, learn about some of our cool areas, our hidden gems, um, and it'll be kind of fun to see what you guys like most about the Forbes. So I'll start off by giving a little bit of background about the forest, but also about the Bureau of Forestry and our mission. So in Pennsylvania, we're really lucky because in our Bill of Rights for the state, we are entitled to the right of clean air, pure water, and the preservation of the natural, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. And this has been promised to us and also to future generations. So this is kind of legislation groundwork that really allows us to do the work we do and also to really know that we're coming into this with a very long-term um, view set that we're making sure these resources are available for not just us but for future generations as well. Within the Bureau of Forestry, our mission um, entails the long-term health, viability, and productivity Activity of the Commonwealth's forest and to conserve native plants. So this, you'll notice, it doesn't say our Commonwealth's public forest. It's more broad than that. Our mission really does continue on to private lands. A lot of the forest land within Pennsylvania is actually privately held. So we'll touch on it a little bit um, towards the end of the presentation, but that's something that I focus on is some of our outreach with private landowners as well. So this is something that's just really important because our forests haven't always looked the way that they look today. At the turn of the 1900s, this is more what our forests were looking like. So it was a time when logging was occurring. Um, our forests were being cut over, clear cut, used as a resource. Um, a lot of this wood was going to iron furnaces. It was going to build various um, wooden needs like our railroad lines and a variety of other uses. And this is what our forests were looking like. It was sad, but it was also an opportunity because after the lumber companies cut the timber, they really didn't have a use for the land. And um, some of our forefathers with a lot of forethought thought about what could we do with this land? And luckily we have Pincho in our back pocket as a Pennsylvanian who was really prominent and wanted to make sure that our forests were managed using sound forestry principles, which was pretty novel at the time. And this land is the land that a lot of our state forests um, was able to purchase cheaply or acquire um, because of back taxes and that sort of thing. And it became our state forest land. So today we have about 2.2 million acres of state forest land. Um, this gives you a little bit of history about the Forbes in particular. Our first acquisition was in 1909, so a little over 100 years ago. 
And from there, of course, have really changed and grown. And we're thinking about managing them in a very ecosystem-based um, format where we're thinking about the services that they provide um, as a place to recreate, as a place to make sure that our water stays clean, as a place for a habitat of various wildlife species. We're thinking about all these things when we manage our forests. And we're able to do that because of the acquisitions that have happened over time, which just kind of shows you our very first acquisition was within the Laurel Mountain Division. And from there, we've expanded and we have land um, in Allegheny, no, sorry, in Fayette County, in Westmoreland, and in Somerset counties, mostly along the ridges, including the highest point in Pennsylvania. So, this is a little bit of what our forests are looking like today because we are able to manage them in a more sustainable way. Um, we practice conservation, so we do use the resource um, and we use it in a way that propagates it to continue into the future. Throughout Pennsylvania, we have 20 forest districts, so we're just one of them, and we're located in the southwest corner, the Ford State Forest. Um, you can see um, our area is bigger than just the counties that we have state forest in, and that's because we're not only responsible for the public land, but we also provide services for private landowners as well. This is a map of our forested areas. You can see how it does kind of cover a lot of the ridges with our public land, and it's very connected. Um, we have a lot of state parks in our area and game lands, and that state and land is really connected and it makes a corridor that can really help to um, conserve these natural places in the larger scale. Our state forest has over 60,000 acres. Um, like we mentioned, it was founded back in 1909, so over 100 years old, and we're providing services to all of southwestern Pennsylvania. Our state forest is divided into five divisions that are along three ridges. So we have the Laurel Ridge, the Chestnut Ridge, and the Mount Davis Ridge. And we have quite a few natural wild areas and wild plant sanctuaries that Rachel will dive into. Who we are, we have a wide mix of staff that contribute to making our state forest what it is. Um, we have maintenance staff, managers, clerical. We have forestry technical staff that are um, specializing in different areas for management forestry, which Brandon fills that role. Um, we're contributing to the management of that public state forest land, but we also have service foresters that are our education and outreach arm. We have fire foresters that have a special responsibility to make sure that we're prepared for wildfires and that our partners are prepared as well. Rachel is our environmental education specialist who has a role in public outreach as well as the recreation on our state forest. And we have forest rangers to make sure that people are using the resource wisely and safely. Now I'll pass it over to Rachel to talk about some of these specific areas. Thank you, Celine. Can everybody hear me all right? Thumbs up. All right, excellent. So as Celine said, I'm Rachel Mahoney. I am the Environmental Education Specialist at Forbes State Forest, and I'm going to be taking over for talking a little bit about some of our special places uh, and specially managed areas on Forbes State Forest. So wild areas are specially designated areas that are located across the board on DCNR land. So this is both within state forest and state park land. And in total, um, across the state of Pennsylvania, there are about 100 wild and natural areas across the state, which is pretty cool and fairly unique um, to the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so specifically wild areas, these are areas, again, that have a special designation and areas that are set aside to protect unique ecological, natural, and historical areas. But then also they are managed to maintain wild character 
and provide backcountry recreation opportunities. So within our wild areas on Forbes State Forest, which we just have, I guess, one, I should say, singular wild area um, is a Quebec run wild area and that is located in southern Fayette County. And within the Quebec run wild area, there is an opportunity for backpacking, uh, primitive overnight camping. Occasionally you'll see horseback riders, hikers, mountain bikers. So it really it truly is an area for uh, a variety of recreational pursuits. But again, uh, within a wild area, it's a location where we won't necessarily do any sort of timber management activity um, because again, we're maintaining that wild character. The majority of the management activity that we pursue within wild areas is going to be uh, for trail maintenance. Next slide, Celine. A natural area is a little bit different than a wild area, but again, it is a special uh, designation that DCNR lands, uh, some DCNR lands have, and these areas are managed by nature essentially. And human intervention is fairly limited within these areas. And an example of a natural area would be an area that has unique plants or animal species um, that can provide places for scenic observation to protect specific plant and animal communities and then conserve outstanding examples of natural beauty. Within natural areas, you will not see any sort of permanent human built structures. So if you visit a natural area and you come to a trail with a stream crossing, you will not see bridges. You will be responsible for fording the stream. Um, but to clarify, there are trails within natural areas, but that will be the only human-made structure that is really maintained. Um, you won't see any sort of buildings, outhouses, things like that. They are fairly primitive areas. Next slide. Um, a third designation, a very special place. Um, again, the DCNR designation, but also private landowner designation is a wild plant sanctuary. So this is a designation that, again, crosses the line between what DCNR will designate some of their land area as, but it's also a designation that private landowners can pursue for their own private property, which is really cool. For a wild plant sanctuary, it's an area, speaking on it as a DCNR side of things, is DCNR land. Um, that receives special management to protect biodiversity while enhancing and sustaining habitat. So again, these areas are specifically designated to manage and protect native wild plants. And these areas may have rare plant species. It might be an area that supports native pollinators, or it might have other unique features. Um, and the, on the private landowner side of things, as we already have discussed the DCNR designation, um, that you can, as a private landowner, obtain designation by filling out an online application. So that's something kind of cool that you, if you own some property and you might have, uh, you might meet the guidelines for what the designation of a wild plant sanctuary is, uh, is something that you can pursue on your own time. And I can try to put in uh, the web link for that if anybody is interested in learning more about that. So diving in a little bit deeper, so we have a little bit of an understanding of the specially designated areas on DCNR land as well as private land, but where are these places located on the Forbes? As Celine had mentioned, our state forest is over 60,000 acres of state forest land spanning Westmoreland, Somerset, and Fayette counties. And among that forest land, we have these specially designated areas. We have the Mount Davis Natural Area, as one of our natural areas. It's a land area that spans uh, roughly 581 acres. And for those of you that may be familiar with that area, it is very special because it contains the highest point in the state of Pennsylvania, Mount Davis. And Mount Davis is this rock. <laughs> it's high point rock, as I like to call it. Um, it has a USGS benchmark on it. So for those of you that may have not visited Mount Davis before and you're venturing out that way, maybe to do some past peak leaf peeping or to go out and explore before winter time, um, 
you might be confused as to where the actual high point is. It is actually uh, the sandstone rock. And this area is designated as a natural area due to its unique geological and historical features. So again, it is the highest point in the state of Pennsylvania, which makes it a very special location. And it draws the visitors from all across the country. Here's just a couple of photos. Um, for those of you that have visited the Mount Davis natural area, right outside of the natural area boundary is the high point observation area. And that's where you will find the high point observation tower. And it stands 50 feet above the highest point in the state. So if you're feeling daring and you're not too afraid of heights or too shy, um, you can climb up that tower. Um, but just a brief disclaimer, since we are venturing into late fall and the winter is just around the corner, it's, it's important to note that not all of our roads on state forest land are maintained during the winter time. And the Mount Davis area is one of those areas where um, pretty much none of our roads are, our forest roads are maintained. So I would recommend not visiting the observation area during the winter time, but waiting until spring, uh, summer or into fall. The second natural area that we have on Forbes State Forest is the Roaring Run Natural Area. And this area is really special because it is essentially a forested watershed. Um, this land area encompasses most of the Roaring Run watershed, which is something that you don't ordinarily see within um, a natural or a wild area designation. So that makes this space very, very special. About 3,500 acres in size and is located on the western slope of the Laurel Ridge. Uh, within the Roaring Run Wild Area, or I'm sorry, Natural Area, there is a lot of opportunity for um, hiking as well as just exploring. Um, there's some unique history in this area as well as unique natural features. And the Roaring Run Natural Area receives its natural area designation because it is a reptile and amphibian um, management area, which is a designation through the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Here's a few photos. Since I can't bring you all out on a hike today, I figured I'd bring the hike to you virtually. I'm big into uh, pictures. So a few photos that I've taken throughout the years uh, that I've been at Forbes of Roaring Run, the stream itself. If you're ever feeling daring and you are looking for an adventurous hike, you can venture onto Roaring Run Trail and it's 30 stream crossings. So again, within natural areas, there aren't foot bridges. So you, your feet will get wet. Um, so I always recommend that folks come prepared with an alternative pair of shoes, but it, it truly is a gorgeous and special area. And then lastly, um, we have one wild area on Forbes State Forest. It's the Quebec Run Wild Area I briefly mentioned before. It's about 7,400 acres in size, and this is located along the eastern slope of the Chestnut Ridge in southern Fayette County. Um, within this area, there are two pristine um, bodies of water, Mill Run and Quebec Run. And Quebec Run is actually a designated wilderness trout stream with native brook trout. For, so for those of you that are into fly fishing, recreational fishing, this is a really great area to check out. And even for those of you that, again, are into maybe mountain biking, um, backpacking, hiking, things like that, it is a really beautiful area. Um, to check out. I strongly recommend it. And I think that anytime anybody asks me, you know, what's your favorite place on the floor? This is definitely in my top two. It really is a hidden gem um, and definitely worth checking out. Here's a few photographs. The picture in the upper left-hand corner, that is of uh, Mill Run. And then on the upper right-hand side, that is a picture of an old um, mill that actually used to be right along um, the stream. So there remains uh, some of the infrastructure from that, some of the stone infrastructure. And um, the bottom left, that is on Hess Trail. Um, there's some unique history down there. Um, and then on the bottom right side, that is another picture of Mill Run. So I'm talking an awful lot about these special area designations. Um, I do wanna just refer back to, I had talked about the plant sanctuaries and I forgot to mention specifically on this slideshow, we do have one native 
plant or wild plant sanctuary on our state forest, and that is present within the Lynn Run Valley. It is about 270 acres or so in size. And for those of you that are familiar with Lynn Run State Park and uh, delineation of state forest land, um, it is an absolutely beautiful area. The diversity of uh, spring ephemerals are short blooming, um, early, early, early um, to bloom wildflowers is incredible. I uh, recommend visiting the Grove Run area if you do get the chance to do some wildflower peeping, as I like to call it, during the springtime. And then throughout the summer months, it is just a really uh, beautiful area, fertile soils, and a great area to um, view a lot of plant diversity. But anyways, let's let's shift our gears back to recreation. So as Selena had mentioned, I not only offer outreach and um, education to the public, but I also oversee a lot of our recreation management. And I'll try to keep this short and sweet. But again, if anybody has any questions, please drop those questions in the chat box and we will do our best to get those at the other time. But um, as a whole, we have over 300 miles of multi-use trails and roads on Forbes State Forest. So that is pretty incredible. Um, so if you're into um, any sort of agricultural recreation pursuit, this is definitely a great place to visit. Uh, our recreation is not just summer, it's not just winter, it is year round, it's 365 days a year, and in some cases 24-7, depending on how adventurous you may be. But as a whole, the Bureau of Forestry manages our recreational resources much differently than our state park counterparts do. We manage for low density recreation on our state forest, which means um, the amount of trails that we have available, they're going to be, in some instances, much less, much more spaced out. We have a whole separate set of guidelines that we follow um, in order to um, follow our mission and manage our recreational infrastructure. We also, in addition to managing for low density recreation, have a variety of different trail users uh, that venture out onto the Forbes. So to aid the public, to aid you guys with understanding what is permitted where, we have different trail blaze colors, which are just the marks on trees um, that designate different recreation uses, uses. So the blue blazes, those mean that those trails are shared use. However, during the winter months, those trails are maintained for cross-country skiing. So often those blue blaze trails, whenever the snow flies, are going to be cross-country ski trails. And they are also going to be groomed and maintained by volunteers. So it's really important that if you visit areas with these blue blaze trails and areas that are well-known for cross-country skiing to be mindful of the skiers and to stay out of their track. Red Blaze trails are designated hiking trails, but they're also shared use. So you might see other recreation users using these trails, um, similarly to the Blue Blaze trails outside of cross country ski season. Yellow Blazes are going to be present within our natural areas because our natural areas, although they are managed by nature um, and do have some human infrastructure such as trails, those areas are limited to foot traffic only. There's no other recreational uh, opportunities available within natural areas to conserve and protect that land. So you'll only see yellow blazes on Forbes State Forest when you are within a natural area or if you are in close proximity to Laurel Ridge State Park, also known as the Laurel Highlands Hiking Trail. Orange blazes will come in the shape of diamonds, and those will fall along snowmobile trails, which are also joint use roads. Accessible recreation on our state forest can be quite limited. However, we do have some opportunities for folks um, that do have uh, physical disabilities. Uh, powered mo mobility devices are, are an option for folks that do have um, some sort of physical disability that might want to hunt or access their trails. And the power mobility device information is available online. If you need more information about that, I'll gladly drop that link in the chat box after I'm done speaking. Um, but that's a process that you can go to any state park or state forest office to, um, to get one. And then there is a list of designated trails and rules and regs for that power mobility device, but it is a free service that we do offer to provide accessibility to all. 
Um, again, accessible trails can be challenging on a state forest. We are fairly primitive um, in comparison to state parks, as well as just having the low, dense rec low density recreation opportunity. Um, but we do have some accessible trails. And to get information on that, you can look on DCNR's website or contact us specifically at the Forbes and we can help you with that information. We do our best as well for inclusive programming opportunities offered by our service foresters, as well as myself as an environmental educator, offering programming to a, a wide variety of age groups, people of different walks of life, families, elderly individuals, people with disabilities. Um, so there are lots of outreach and educational opportunities available. If you would like that, you can check our website or contact us directly. Camping is a really big deal nowadays. So um, I might get some questions about how COVID has affected our recreation. And I would say that it has greatly impacted our state forest. We're seeing visitation numbers higher than we have ever seen. Um, still to this day, not quite as high as April and March of 2020, but still elevated. And with that, we are seeing a great interest in camping. Um, to the point where a lot of our motorized campsites are completely blocked and have been blocked throughout the year. Um, but just a brief rundown, we do have camping opportunities. There's primitive camping. Primitive camping would be backpack style camping. Our motorized camping simply means that we have designated campsites. We have a total of six scattered throughout our 60,000 acres um, that allow you to drive your vehicle and or in some instances a small trailer to that site. There's a fire ring and picnic table present and then you can camp at that area. It doesn't require you packing all of your gear in and out um, on your back, but rather the ease of your vehicle. So those motorized sites are quite popular and like I said, fairly booked up. It is cold though to know that uh, our motorized sites are free to book. So that is a service that we offer and something if you're interested in getting outdoors and camping, it's something worth investigating and looking into and we'd be more than happy to help you with that. And then group camping, that's something that we get requests to and we have to file special activities agreements, which is a whole other topic for another time. I'll share you guys all the details on that unless if you have specific questions. But the group camping would be for people that are outside of our agency that are maybe looking to guide the scout groups and, and go on their own um, endeavor on their own trip. But it's important to note that with camping, whether it's primitive or motorized, that there are campfire regulations during spring and fall fire season, you have to have written and or verbal permission from our district forester um, to have campfires because it's just a risky time um, if the conditions are right for a fire to potentially spread. So we do our best to mitigate that through having regulations during specific times of the year. Trail user conflict is something that we encounter frequently on our state forest because I had mentioned there are a lot of different recreation users that visit our state forest. We have seen everything from dog sledders to cross country skiers, to snowmobilers, to trail runners, to horses and you name it, everything in between. So one of the things that I'm sure is not just necessarily something that we deal with on the floor, but is probably something that is dealt with about on anywhere in public land is trying to mitigate trail user conflict and trying to meet the needs of different groups that have um, you know, different uses for state forest. So it's something that's very common, again, on public land. And we try to make uh, the information apparent, transparent, as well as providing recommendations for different recreation users um, through publications and information that we post on social media, but also publications that are available on our website. We have a winter recreation brochure that is really helpful with helping to highlight um, a lot of the different trail user conflicts that we deal with during the winter time, as well as just some of the rules and regs. And then we also uh, have an equestrian brochure that helps to guide folks as well as cross country skiing. So we have some brochures for specific recreation groups that tries again to mitigate the conflict. Also what's really amazing is that we have an, a great group of volunteers 
um, that come out and do trail work projects with us throughout the year. And we have people from just about every walk of life, every uh, recreation group comes out to represent their special use on state forests. And we all work together to solve the same problem and reach the same goal, which I think provides the opportunity for discussion among these different groups and helps aid in mitigating some of this conflict. And volunteerism and stewardship is something that is very important to us here at the Forbes. We deal with a variety of different groups of people um, that help us to maintain our state forest land for forest visitors. As some of you may have heard of, you know, going back with a brief history of this year, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, kind of laid out the framework for a lot of our volunteer groups within DC and our land. And if you're not familiar with the Civilian Conservation Corps, it was a program that was enlisted as a result of the Great Depression. Uh, Frank, uh, President Franklin D. Roosevelt started this program as a part of the um, New Deal and employed men from ages 18 through 25 to do a lot of the conservation work that is that now today um, helped to construct many of our state parks and state forests infrastructure. So they really are, the CCC is really the legacy of a lot of our volunteer groups that are present today across the public land. But on Forbes specifically, we have the Youth Conservation Corps, and this is a group of young adults that is a partnership among Forbes and the Loyal Hanna Watershed Association. We employ college students to come out and do conservation work for us throughout the summer. Um, I have a few photos down below of, of some of these groups throughout the years, and they're really a joy to work with how the Pennsylvania Outdoor Corps. So the POC, as we like to call it, they are not specific to the Forbes, but across all of DCNR's land. So the Pennsylvania Outdoor Corps is a program that was just started a few years ago, um, and it enlists uh, college students and high school students in conservation projects across state parks and state forests. And then lastly, we have our Laurel Mountain Volunteer Group, which is specific to Forbes State Forest. And this is where we get those different recreation users together to accomplish the same goal of working on and maintaining our trail systems in the Forbes. And then uh, a, sh a shameless plug I'm putting in is that we're starting a trail steward program on the Forbes, which I am super excited to get moving on um, during the winter time this year. But if you're interested in learning about uh, that adopt a trail program, you can contact me directly and I'd be more than happy to provide you with the guidelines for that. Um, and then we also do off offer job shadowing opportunities as well for high school students and college students to come out with us and learn about our careers. And then just brief trail etiquette. Um, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot. I told Selena I was a storyteller, so <laughs> I'm going to keep this as concise as possible. But trail etiquette is something that's really important for every uh, forest visitor to keep in mind. So just like how we have, you know, them trail manners essentially so just like how we have manners in everyday life you know got to have manners on the trail how the trail users is super important and doing your best to mitigate conflict you can't always make everybody happy but you can try your best to know the roles and regulations in an area before you visit do a little bit of homework do a little bit of research so that you can assure that you have an enjoyable visit but others also have an enjoyable time on the forbes um, so this trail etiquette, you know, um, if you are hiking and you're going uphill, you know, hopefully someone coming downhill will yield to you because you have a much harder time going uphill, something as simple as that. If there's horses that are out on a trail and you're mountain biking or you're hiking, making sure that the person on the horse sees you, or if not, that you do your best to not startle the horse and you, you get out of the area. Um, and again, just doing your research and understanding how you can improve the area, how you can assure that you have a good visit and other people have a visit it's important. And again, as I mentioned, we have a winter trail etiquette brochure um, that is available. I'll put the link in the chat once I'm done talking. And this just highlights again, those special uses for our trails and um, how things can change a little bit during the winter time because Forbes is a very popular place for winter recreation. 
in Leave No Trace, we can't talk about recreation without good old Leave No Trace. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with these seven principles, but essentially they're outdoor ethics or you know, guidelines that you can use to kind of just check off boxes whenever you're out in nature, just playing ahead and preparing, traveling and camping on durable surfaces, so staying on trails is extremely helpful for us. Disposing of waste properly, this is a big thing. This is something that we've seen a huge uptick of um, from COVID and the high visitation and high use that we're receiving is oftentimes seeing dog, dog poop bags left at trailheads, you know, making sure that you're disposing of that properly. If you're leaving it in a trailhead, carry it out with you. Um, same with human waste, you know, we're sick of seeing toilet paper alongside a trail. I don't think anybody wants to see that. So make sure you're taking care of, you know, these natural places. Leave what you find. If you find a cool rock, a cool wildflower, leave it for other visitors. Don't pick it, don't take it. Minimize campfire impacts. Follow those rules and regs for the area that you're staying. Know when wildfire season is, no fi fire weather. Um, that is extremely helpful. Respecting wildlife, you know, making sure you give wildlife a respectful distance. Don't approach wildlife and make sure you don't feed wildlife. And lastly, the most important thing, being considerate of others. And you can do that by following all of the other seven, all the other six principles. I'm going to pass this off to Celine. Thank you. Thanks. So I did want to talk about some of our roles on private forest land. I think it's something that kind of flies under the radar with some of our um, state forest visitors that we do have a responsibility um, and a job to do on private forest land as well. Um, so about 70% of the forest land in Pennsylvania is privately owned. So we are all benefiting from that clean air, clean water um, that's being provided by that forest land. So as the Bureau of Forestry, we like to make sure that the private landowners are empowered to take the best care of it. And we do that by providing technical assistance. So a lot of education and outreach. Um, if you're a private landowner, we're happy to come out as service foresters walk your property with you and give you some advice, answer your questions, any concerns you have. We also do educational programming in a variety of ways for different user groups. Um, we do have forest landowner groups that we're very involved in. Locally, we have a Westmoreland Woodlands Improvement Association that we serve as technical directors for, as well as um, a Southern area group that covers Green and Washington County. We also can help um, provide some connections. There are some federal cost share programs that are kind of similar to what farmers are offered for farmland. We have some opportunities for forest land as well. So getting in touch with your local service forester can provide um, a first point of contact and we can definitely put you in touch with some of these other resources. Within the Forbes, we have three service foresters, all with some distinct responsibilities. So covering Allegheny, Westmoreland, and Somerset counties, and focusing on working with private landowners and what we call the rural um, private forestry is Michael Duchette, and there is his contact information um, for working with the rural landowners in Washington, Green, and Fayette counties is Russ Gibbs. There's his contact information. And then I focus on urban and community forestry throughout all six of our counties. Um, so working with a lot of municipalities, um, street trees, park trees, basically instances where you're managing a single tree at a time um, as opposed to a forest ecosystem. So I would be happy to work with any groups um, or be a resource for any communities out there as well. So a little bit about our urban and community forestry program throughout the state. Um, Tree Vitalize is the brand that we do our urban forestry work through. So we have some very strong partnerships um, within the Forbes. We're partnered really closely with some um, Pittsburgh-based organizations, Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, Tree Pittsburgh are some of our big partners with this program, um, as well as Penn State Extension. So if you are ever familiar with the tree tenders program, um, that would fall under this tree vitalize as well, where it's a 
program that individuals, um, just anyone is welcome to come and learn kind of the basics of taking care of a tree. Um, and that's a training that helps communities to better manage their trees and helps individuals to plant trees um, that are going to live for a long time. So we do a lot of tree plantings in urban and community areas with some money that is from the US Forest Service as well as DCNR with these partnerships. Um, the Tree City USA program, if you're familiar with that sign, we have quite a few in our area. We had um, eight Tree City USAs last year. Every year it's an application process and I review those applications and then we get to award communities this distinction that shows that they have a interest in maintaining the trees in their community and that they back it with action. So having a shade tree commission, um, spending at least $2 per capita or per person on their shade tree program, having an Arbor Day proclamation and celebration are what are the, um, what are needed to become a Tree City USA. So that's a very fun program where we get to recognize communities that are really committed to trees in their communities. And now I'll pass it over to Brandon, our management forester. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so I'm gonna talk about uh, wildfire first. The Bureau of Forestry is mandated by law to suppress wildfires on public and private lands in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, we have two fire seasons, one in the spring and one in the fall. The spring fire season occurs after snow melt and before leaves grow on the trees to provide shade and moisture to the forest floor. The fall fire season is after the leaves come off the trees until we receive our first snowfall. In District 4, we have two individuals whose primary job involves fire. They lead suppression efforts when there are incidents in the district they investigate causes of wildfires, provide training to volunteer firefighters, and deputize game wardens. Fire wardens act as field representatives to suppress, investigate, and report wildfires during the fire season. This map, as of August 9th of this year, shows wildfires reported in Pennsylvania. As you can see, there were 1,295 wildfires reported, which accounted for 2,837 acres burnt. As you may or may not be able to see at the bottom is listed the causes of each wildfire. Debris burning was the leading cause of wildfire started in Pennsylvania, and it's, caught, but it's by a large margin. And debris burning is historically always the leading cause of fires in the Commonwealth. So now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and I wanna talk about our firewood cutting program. So individuals can get a firewood permit from our district to utilize dead trees for fuel. And I'm gonna throw a lot of numbers at you. So if you have questions, um, you can get our permit online or by calling the district office. And all these um, figures are on our brochure. So our permits are sold for $20 a cord. And you may ask, what's a cord? A cord is a stack of, of firewood, four feet by four feet by eight feet, or 128 cubic feet. You can get two cords of wood on one firewood permit. A permit is good for 30 days and we allow five cords per household per year. The trees have to be dead and they can be standing or already on the ground. And this is for personal use only. The season for cutting firewood is from April 1st to the first day of rifle bear season. And when you get your permit, you have to select which division you plan on cutting in. Now I'm gonna specifically talk about my job of managing state forest land. 
This picture is a general photo of the forest types in Pennsylvania. We further break these down into smaller units called stands that are categorized by zoning, timber type, timber age, productivity of the site, and commercial availability. As you've been described before, we have five divisions of state forest land in District 4. And they kind of described where they are to you. We have one area in the southeastern tip of Westmoreland County, which runs in over into Somerset County. We have land in the western part of Somerset County. Mount Davis, the highest point in Pennsylvania, is in south central Somerset County. And we have land, which is where I manage, in south central Fayette County, which runs down to the West Virginia border. We have a diverse forest making up Appalachian Oak, Northern Hardwood Forest, and mixed Mesophytic forest types. Our state forests are managed for pure water, low density recreation, scenic beauty from our overlooks, aquatic features, geographic features, and currently, if it's not too late already, our fall foliage. We manage for plant and animal habitats through wild areas and plant sanctuaries. Timber harvesting provides the diverse habitats that animals like using also. We manage for sustainable timber where we get wood products that we use every day and for generations to come. And we also manage for other uses, uses and values. We use a variety of silviculture tools to achieve the objective of having a very diverse, sustainable forest. And how we achieve that goal is we usually start out with some type of timber harvest. In District 4, we usually start out with a shutterwood harvest, which is a cut where you thin the stand and remove the less desirable trees, whether that's species-based or just poor quality growing timber. And we do that to provide the right light conditions for natural regeneration to flourish to be able to start a new stand. We can do non-commercial thinnings and younger stands to change species composition or provide growing space for trees to grow more rapidly. If we have a total regeneration failure or have to do a salvage harvest due to some type of disturbance, whether it's from a tornado, ice damage, or insect defoliation, all of which have occurred in District Force history, we have the ability to plant seedlings, which origins come from the state forest. So every fall, or actually like the last couple weeks, um, we pick seed, whether it's from pine, oak, maple, or poplar, that seed is given to the, our state nursery where they grow the seed out to seedlings and then we can replant them throughout the state forest. We have the ability to erect deer exposure fences if the deer browsing pressure is having a negative effect on the natural regeneration causing a failure to the stand. We can use prescribed fire to promote oak seedlings by killing undesirable species such as birch or killing native competition such as mountain laurel to prepare a seed bed. Invasive species are a growing problem in areas of the state forest, so we can use herbicide to kill invasive species, or if it's in some of our like more sensitive areas, like I'm pretty sure Rachel's done this in the um, Lynn Run area where they uh, actually pulled invasive species by hand. So after using one or all of the tools at our disposal, and we have a stand that is well stocked with desirable regeneration, we can do a final timber harvest, which is called an overstory removal with residuals. There are instances when you have the ability to go straight to a clear cut with do, without doing any type of preparatory cut in the stands if you have enough advanced regeneration with little or no competition. 
I wanted to stress that we have aquatic buffer guidelines to save trees along aquatic features, and we have aesthetic buffer guidelines to save more trees along roads and trails. So we do not do your typical clear cut that everyone thinks about where there are zero trees left after our final harvest. We always have residual trees left throughout the stand. Here's a, just a picture of one of our timber harvests. Uh, this is a shelter wood and you can see it's fenced and it's prior to everything starting to grow back. So just to see what it looks like. Here's oak natural regeneration. And that is what we strive for because it is less time and money to achieve, to achieve our mission of ensuring the long-term health, viability, and productivity of the Commonwealth's forest and to conserve wild plants. We do that by promoting a diverse forest with a balanced age class and it's to provide a sustainable yield of forest products for generations to come. And lastly, we are dual certified by two third party independent organizations, one being the Forest Stewardship Council or FSC, and the other is the Sustainable Forest Initiative or SFI. And what they do is they audit us every year and make sure we are doing sound, sustainable forest management, whether that is through timber sales, wildlife habitat, or working with user groups such as yourself. And that's all I have. So thank you very much. All right, folks. Um, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, we are going to open it up to Q&A. There are some questions in the chat that I'll be reading off momentarily. I do want to recognize that it is a little closer to one o'clock right now than we had initially um, thought that we would be. So um, the you're all okay with staying a few minutes over so that way we can answer the questions. All right, um, if you think of a question you would like answered after our presentation is over today, you can uh, either send it to me directly or I will be um, sharing out the contact information of our presenters today. Um, you can ask them directly if you would rather um, do so. So with that being said, I'm gonna just, um, I'll ask the questions generically and then whichever one of you wants to answer feel free to do so. Um, so our first question was about uh, ticks within the forest district. It's a, always a big big question and a big problem. So um, they were asking if, they, if you have any specific information on ticks or tick spread disease prevalence within the state forest. Um, I don't know, Brandon, if you have any, any more insight, but we don't have any specific data on our state forest uh, tick population, but if you are not familiar with East Stroudsburg University of Pennsylvania has the tick lab. Um, if you just go on Google, you can type ticklab.org or Pennsylvania tick lab, and you can actually sign up for a weekly uh, newsletter that has a tick report attached to it and it will educate you on the prevalence of adult versus nymphs versus um, deer tick versus other species or varieties of ticks in the state and how prevalent they are during that week time frame. Um, so that is extremely helpful and a tool that we use um, but we do not develop. So if you don't know about the tick lab, I strongly urge that you check that out. And they also offer a free tick testing service to all of Pennsylvania's residents. So if you or a pet has an embedded tick, you can retrieve it. You can go on the tick lab's website. You can print out a receipt and mail it into them and they will test that tick for you for any tick-borne illness or disease, which is an amazing service. And it's something that I personally have used many times. And I know that our Bureau um, has partnered with them and we utilize that as well. So sorry, that wasn't very specific, but that's 
best answer we have because that's the tool that we all use here. I love yeah, I would, I would just stress too, anytime you go out in the woods, always check yourself because people are under the assumption that, uh, is this a down year for ticks or not? Every year, is, they're bad all, all the time. If you're in thick brush, you're going to have ticks on you. Uh, our next question is specific to Quebec Run. Um, they were wondering what access is like to the mill at Quebec Run, and uh, they want to know why the mill is located where it is. Yeah, that's a great question. I saw that. So the grist mill is located along Mill Run. So um, it used water power in order to grind the um, like cornmeal or wheat down into um, flour or cornmeal. Um, so that's why it was located along the stream. Now, if, and I did in the chat, I dropped a link for all of our maps and publications that we have at the Forbes. If you open up the Quebec run map, um, the grist mill remnant, so that stone wall is present at the intersection of grist mill and mill run trail. So right along um, where the stream is located. It's, it's right off of the trail. It's very easy to spot. The trail is right above the grist mill and the grist mill is just a few feet below um, where the trail is located, but it isn't hidden. Um, it is very apparent in this time of the year with all of the leaves falling, it will be much easier to spot. Uh, the next question references ATV use within the state forest. Um, and they were wondering what the biggest problems with ATV trespass and uh, what are your biggest problems with ATV trespass and damage? Um, they did leave an email address in the, the chat as well if the question uh, is more, if the question warrants more of an answer than, you know, just a quick response. Um, I can't really speak on behalf of, you know, our law enforcement rangers, our forest rangers would be, um, you know, who could probably answer that the best. They are the individuals that deal with uh, much of the illegal ATV activity on our state forest. Um, so I don't, you know, I can't answer that um, to a T, but I can say we do deal with some illegal ATV activity um, and our law enforcement uh, deals with, with those individuals. Um, the next question was asking if there were ever any um, tours or um, public programs to uh, teach more about the steps between harvests um, or tim timber management in general. Yeah, so um, every year our Westmoreland Woodlands Improvement Association does a tour on the Forbes State Forest, usually the Laurel Mountain Division. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And they also do a lot of other educational activities, like bringing in different speakers and that sort of thing. So definitely a cool resource. Um, but that is our annual tour. We partner with them to do that. Um, and what time of year was that annual tour again? It's usually late summer. Um, our next question was uh, wondering if uh, the forest district ever does any seedling sales as a form of fundraising. We do not. Um, our seedlings that are grown at Penn Nursery have to be used on public lands per um, an agreement with the Nurserymen's Association. But um, Howard Nursery, the Game Commission's nursery, does do annual sales for their seedlings. Um, the order forms come out at the beginning of the year, like January, and they go pretty fast. And then the seedlings are delivered in April when it's nice to plant them. So keep an eye out for them. The next question was asking um, if uh, the foresters keep in mind the concept of mother trees when managing the forest. So we try to keep, when we do our shelter woods, we initially will leave, I guess, what you would consider mother trees to provide seed to start regeneration. Um, but we normally those trees, I would 
imagine are getting cut. Um, but we do save, I mean, I think what the state forest is 60,000 acres in district four. And I want to say 27,000 acres is all we're um, allocated to cut on. So we're, we're actually not cutting on over half of the state forest in district four. I don't know if I answered the question. Um, I don't see a follow up message in the chat. Um, but if um, further clarification needs to be made for that question, Rachel is sharing the contact information in the chat for all of the presenters today. Um, and like I said, I will be sharing that out as well in the follow up email I send out uh, with a copy of the recording and the slide deck used today. Um, I have I have a question, Rachel. Would you be able to share out um, the link for access to the um, powered mobility devices that you mentioned earlier? All right. And all of the links that are shared, I will also share out in the follow up email. Um, if we don't have any further questions, um, I'll wrap it up for this afternoon. Um, it, again, if you think of any further questions after the presentation is done today, feel free to reach out to myself or any of our presenters and we'll do our best to answer any questions that you have. So um, thank you again for attending our presentation today and thank you to all of the foresters who took time out of their day to tell us more about one of our 20 awesome forest districts within the state. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon.